meeting of the Senate Agricultural Committee and our main discussion this morning is setting up a, an agenda for the future and talking um, about uh, how the COVID funds are are moving out and being spent and as well as dealing and hearing about the uh, 2021 ag budget as it pertains to the last three quarters so um we'll we'll get started i i don't know if any of the members have questions um uh, to start with uh chris pearson um well uh, it doesn't have to address it now. We can wait if you want, but I'm hoping we can just talk about when and how committee meets um, for the next few weeks. So I don't, I don't know if you want to hear from the secretary and then and his folks, and then we move on to that kind of discussion. Or I'm just yeah, hoping I, we could have some sense of it. Uh, and I'm, I'll be honest and say I hope it's not all four days, but. Um, as needed or or maybe a couple of days a week scheduled, something like that. Well, uh, I'm hoping that we could do uh, uh, Tuesdays and maybe Thursdays or something like that, because then we have uh, more time in the morning because uh, Friday we have to get done early to go on the floor and uh, Tuesdays, uh, it's right after we get off the floor. So, uh, but we can talk about that and set up the schedule. And the other issue, I think dealing with that is how we uh, work to get more people onto the YouTube and, and being able to hear what we're talking about. And, and uh, if they have input and they're not on the agenda, how we address that. So we can talk about all those things um, when we get done with the secretary uh, and Diane. So good morning, Mr. Secretary and, and welcome and Diane, welcome. Um, were you gonna do a budget or COVID this morning? I thought we'd begin with uh, with the budget, and we're yep. we're open to talking about COVID if you'd like as well. But I thought maybe we would begin uh, with with the budget, and so you're just uh, apprised of what uh, what we're doing. We we presented to House Appropriations uh, earlier today, and then we're going to be talking with uh, uh, Senate Appropriations uh, later today. So I think it might be a good time to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the budget and how it may um, impact some of the decisions that. Uh, you make even related to, to COVID. So I thought uh, that might be best. I, I don't know if we, uh, we've sent along a, a budget uh, document uh, to you. Um, and I just maybe, I don't know if we want to bring that up on the screen or if we just want to wait for that later or we can go slide to slide or whatever your pleasure. Well, it share. would be good if Linda could pull that. Do you have that, Linda, so you can pull it up? I yes. don't have it. They can email it to me. I sent it over earlier, Linda. Oh, sorry, I'll get it on very shortly. Okay, well, that's happening. I can just give you a, um, a little bit of overview. Um, so let's let's go back to maybe March when, when COVID started, um, you know, meat inspection, uh, dairy farms, uh, plant inspection, the Vail Lab in Randolph, all considered essential employees. Uh, they have been working, um, they have not stopped. So they've been carrying out all their duties uh, throughout the, uh, the pandemic. As the warm weather came, we opened up more and as Vermont opened up more, uh, more duties were added that resumed activities, including weights and measures, um, out doing gas pumps and truck scales, um, more on-farm inspections, and, and also the engineering of projects for farmers got underway. Animal health has been uh, busy. We had some, uh, issues with some animals uh, coming from the Midwest that were making their way to Vermont, mainly centered around some of the um, processing facilities in the Midwest closing and some of those animals uh, being repurposed to, uh, uh, to Vermont. Um, farm uh, continuing to do uh, pesticide monitoring, testing certification, also testing the feed, uh, make sure that is all, all okay. 
just a little bit on the operations of the uh, organization. 116 State Street, where I am today, is pretty much been closed except to four to six people have been working out of here, mainly, mainly out of the administration, uh, the business office, and a little bit of water quality as well. Um, we've gotten a lot of productivity working from home. About a third of the agency staff uh, has been working from home on a regular basis and may have heard the administration. You're kind of cutting out, Anderson. Okay. Uh, about a third of the agency has been working uh, from uh, remotely, and that will continue uh, at least through January um, as things uh, continue on. Although we do have a number of people that already work from the field because they're inspectors and work with our uh, producers and farmers in the field. Um, maybe we can go to the uh, granting programs slide. If we can go, I think it's the second or third one in. Is that part of the budget? Yeah, it it will yeah. relate to the it will relate to the budget, and and I think it's important that you get a sort of an overview of, of uh, the scope of work that's being done and how that's going to tie into our our budget proposal. So um, just a refresher, we do have three granting programs that have been going through the Agency of Agriculture. Maybe um, Linda could roll that up to the third slide. Be good if she could. Are you there, Linda? Michael, do you know if Linda's on? Linda, I think you have to download it. Once you download it, it'll let you um, go page to page. So if you just go down, uh, it says download, print, OneDrive. You need to download it, and then you can select the page. OK, thank you. So have you all had a good summer while we're waiting? <laughs> yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you did, Brian, because it can't be go. the others. Let's go back. Did. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so um, just a refresher, um, there are three granting programs that are currently going through the agency. Um, one is um, um, the dairy producer and, and dairy farmer and the processor one of $25 million. Um, that one is, uh, is underway. Uh, we are uh, sending money to processors and dairy farmers. I think by the end of the week, probably about $4 million will have reached those businesses. Um, the agriculture fairs application closed uh, last Thursday at two o'clock of uh, this week. Um, we're reviewing those applications, going back to the fairs and field days if they have to supply any information, if they want to make any corrections. Uh, so this week we should finalize that half a million dollars um, going to those. There's about 14 in play, um, 14 different organizations. As you know, the fairs and field days had to uh, cancel this year because of no large gatherings. Also, working lands and agriculture that, producers. Anson, yes. yes. And does uh, is that just the Vermont uh, Ag and Field Days? Like I know we're part of the one over in Lancaster, but does that wouldn't include them, would it? Or would it? It would not. It's just yeah. the Vermont-based uh, fairs and field days. Mr. Chair, can I just inquire from Anson? Did the uh, Vermont State Fair make application, do you know? I do believe they did. I, okay. Yeah, I think Thank they're in there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so hopefully by you know next week, um, those will be buttoned up and uh, we can get some of those checks uh, over to finance and, and, and get those out the door. Um, the third pocket, which is underway, uh, which is our um, producers in this, connected to working lands as well. 
Um, there's an $8.5 million um, granting program there. And that may cover a wide array of, of producers. It may be a vegetable farmer. It may be a farmer's market. It may be a slaughterhouse. It may be a sugar maker, uh, maybe a value added uh, food business as well. Um, so that application is out. Um, those applications are, are started to, to come in. And as of this morning, um, we have received uh, 31 applications. It's a mix of sectors, including you know maple, forestry, equine is in there, produce, orchards, uh, and also hemp. Um, so there are about 73 others that have started the application. Uh, so the, the population right now is about 104 people have, have inquired or started the application or have submitted their application for that. Um, we're going to start um, reviewing those applications and also VITA is helping us approve those applications um, uh, down the road as once we get into the review section of those. Did Anson, did we put a cap on those uh, those particular programs? I believe there's a cap on of twenty thousand dollars. Correct me if I'm wrong, Diane, but I think it was a cap of, of uh, twenty thousand um, dollars. You put a series of caps on the money that was in the Senate bill based on uh, gross income. So the smallest was two thousand five hundred, and the largest was twenty thousand. So you did put a series of caps in there based on gross income. Yep. So it's it's going well. Uh, we are really pushing uh, the messaging now. Uh, we think uh, we we've got some. Um, we have a newsletter um, that goes out uh, weekly. We sent out another bulletin. I think yesterday on this, our newsletter is about forty six hundred people. It goes to so that's going out on a weekly basis. Uh, we also have Ag Review both online and the paper edition. Uh, we've really been pushing on a daily basis all these programs on our social media and links to all the applications and questions. Uh, Facebook with about 13,000 uh, people uh, signed up for that. Also Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, we're working closely with all our partners and making sure that they have the information they need so they can distribute it to their uh, membership, including uh, NOFA, uh, Farm Bureau, Rural Vermont, and all the industry groups. Uh, making sure they are aware of these programs. We also have a robust internal listserv that uh, we take out, and also um, general media. We've been using, uh, you know, press releases. Um, the governor has highlighted these programs um, during his uh, news conferences, um, and also we've we've had some coverage in uh, the general media, uh, just alerting people that these programs are are there and available. Um, and then we've got some workshops over the next couple of weeks, some tip sessions uh, to make sure that folks um, are aware of all these, all these programs. And because uh, we do have some um, deadlines that are, that are approaching. So we want to make sure, um, you know, under the CARES Act, uh, we want to make sure we use all this money and don't leave any on the table. Um, so we've got to get this money out the door by, you know, um, all the, you know, state money by at least um, December unless Congress changes those parameters so um uh, ruth has a question anson yes thanks bobby um mr secretary i don't i wasn't sure if we we're doing questions now but um i know that when you all testified in june about this um there was some concern that you didn't have uh contact information or you weren't sure who a lot of these producers and farmers might be in the non-dairy section. And I'm wondering um, twofold, if one, you're sort of becoming acquaint acquainted with uh, operations, farms, producers that you didn't know of before, are, and are you keeping that information so you're building up a, a better database of who the, of the, the broader agriculture community at, or are you just seeing the ones that you you already knew about? Um, so I guess the twofold: are you collecting data as you're going, and are you seeing new operations that you weren't aware of, or are they the same ones you knew of? Yeah, we've we've always been in uh, uh, close contact with uh, anyone that's working in and around agriculture. The difference here is many of these may not be regulated by the agency, so that's the difference. It wasn't that we weren't 
in touch with them or engaged with them. The Ag Dev Division has close relationships with whether it be farmers markets, whether it be value added businesses. Dairy is unique in, for two reasons. One, it's, it's, it's highly regulated through uh, sanitation on that end and also water quality. So, and we have, you know, we have the small farm, certified small farm, medium farm, large farm. So we're on a regular basis of those being um, regulated. On the other aspect, it's, it's working closely with, uh, you know, NOFA, it's working closely with rural Vermont, the Farm Bureau, Maple Sugars Association, um, the people in the hemp um, industry, all those were very close with and work with them on a daily basis. It's just that this database um, wasn't regularly out there. Um, and we don't, to this day, we don't know if, what the total audience uh, might be. It could be 7,000, it could be 5,000, but we've, we've, been, we've done a really um, concerted effort to try to do as much outreach to just as many groups as we possibly can to make sure that they are, they are aware of this uh, program through, um, through this second pocket. Also the Working Lanes Group, there's a, a good um, section of people that may have been through that program before that know about these uh, programs. So they've, they've been engaged in messaging there. So it's been, uh, um, okay. we've always been with them. It's just a matter that, of- Well, the, the testimony study. from the agency in June was that you didn't know who any of these or, or many of these right. people were. That was that was what your, your testimony from the agency was. And, and that why it was made it difficult for us to figure out how much funding to put in this category because there wasn't a lot of data available. But um, it sounds yeah, like I think, it's a I think little different I, now. No, you know, I think it's, a, it, I think the difference is we just, we don't, because they're not regulated through the agency, that's the difference. So you can't just call up the address and, and send it out. That's, that's the, that was the point we were trying to make. We were not engaged with them, but we're engaged with these groups on, on a regular basis. And they're very, very, very important to our landscape and our agricultural economy. And, and we want to support them and believe in them. And uh, we want to make sure that they get these dollars if they qualify for them and get them because um, this, is, this is important work as we get forward uh, post, post here. Okay, thank you. Anson, is that, is that cutoff date uh, for them uh, too short? Should that have been stretched out or how the applications coming in? Um, we, are, we are certainly open to making sure that um, as long as we don't get up against that deadline where we have to return money. But so, isn't it September 15th or something? Yeah, we've got, we've got some tight deadlines that are coming up. And I think as long as you don't, you know, um, you know, change the application that's already in a dramatic way, we are open to extending the deadlines. Extending deadlines is not going to have any impact of how we possibly it will have an impact. But the more time that we can give farmers and producers to get this application in, we are all in favor of that. We just want to make sure that we have the time that so we don't, you know, but up against some sort of federal deadline or some decisions that have to be made if there's some money left over where you might want to repurpose that money as well. So you gotta you gotta add it in, but maybe some of these deadlines that and they're they're deadlines throughout state government that are different on each program. Yeah, uh, the, Chris had a question. Yeah, um, so I just want to make sure because the deadlines are part of the concern that I have. Uh, so your secretary, you're open to us tweaking that, recognizing we don't want to then brush up against December 30th. But in terms of that, I, I just want to be crystal clear. Yeah. And then I, have a question I, I think, that. you know, and I, and, you know, Diane is, and, and Allison can, can also weigh in, but I think, you know, tweaking deadlines is not going to, I, I think maybe wise in some of these, you know, we are, you know, there's no good time for a farmer to fill out an application because it's nonstop all the time. And, and there is some paperwork involved here. There is some, you know, documentation that has to be done, you know, for someone to get two hours of the day, sometimes it's very difficult and, and it's harvest time for a lot of folks. So uh, we are open to, to tweaking the deadlines as long as we don't, you know, leave any money, you know, on the table that may impact the right. program. And then, and then along those lines, uh, the report that came in uh, that 
we'd asked you guys to submit just suggested that even in the dairy where you know the presumptions we built in uh in the dairy assistance we assumed that virtually all farmers would take advantage of that and and uh i'm seeing that it was 11 percent um have been awarded or something it, it, you know it's pretty low i i, I guess or lower than I would have imagined. Can you just talk about that? And are you seeing trends there where it's the bigger dairies that are moving through the application by virtue of having staff or, or more personnel and the smaller are stuck in the field, literally? Um, can you help us understand yeah. any explanation around those numbers being low and, and the trend that you're seeing that we should be aware of? Yes, thank you, Senator. We um, we have about, I think about 50, I think the latest figure is about 55% of either started the application or have completed the application or have received payment. So it is starting to get, um, uh, you know, people are starting to engage more on it. Um, and, you know, Diane can maybe speak to, she's in the trenches here, looking at the application, seeing how they're coming in and the documentation. Um, and some of it also may, uh, there may be some strategy involved here as well uh, with losses and expenses, depending on how the, uh, the price of milk goes up and down and so forth. And also some of the federal programs that are out there and how they uh, work uh, for or against uh, the state programs. So I'll, I'll let Diane speak to a little bit more of the nuts and bolts, but we are seeing more people um, start to engage and, and process uh, these applications, knowing that the October 1st deadline is uh, approaching quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I think Diane had to hop off. Um, oh, she did. Okay. One of the concerns that I had in the program we set up was that um, it was obvious, again, based on the assumption that dairy would sort of all come in looking for assistance, and, and we all recognize dairy's been hard hit. Uh, the program was structured so that the money uh, would sort of favor dairy and couldn't move if there was money left over in the dairy portion, couldn't move to diversified producers. Whereas if there was money left over in the diversified non-dairy, it could go to dairy. Um, you know, recognizing we're going to learn a lot more in the next few weeks is there any opening uh, at the agency to maybe make sure that it could go either way if, if in fact there's a logic for dairy to just take advantage of federal programs or, or, or whatever? I, I always seemed like we should just be as flexible as possible, recognizing we would learn more week by week. So I'd love you to comment on that, please. Yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, you know flexibility is 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 great in any program, um, and I think if we, you know, as we get more data, as we get more people um, applied and and through it, and you know, we know the audience, particularly with dairy, we know exactly um, how many are out there because of the regulation that they're under. So we know it's an audience of between the processors and the, the producers. It's about it's about eight hundred, you know, eight hundred plus. So we know exactly where they are. Um, you know, um, there's, there's some other things that you could do. You could, you know, maybe increase the, the award, um, you know, the grant totals. Um, you know, some of the early um, stuff we rolled out did have some um, bigger awards to, uh, to the smaller farmers. Um, but I think if we look at the data, I, th I think if more people, um, you know, apply, and we'll probably know in a couple of weeks on the uh, on the working lands and ag producer program. We'll know um, we'll get a sense of where that program is heading as well. If if we're being swamped with applications there, that will give us some indication. What we want to do is we want to we want to make sure we use these dollars in the most effective way to get them out to the ground where they're needed. Um, we're seeing some very creative things that are happening um, as this goes on. Like, for example, one, one cheesemaker, uh, his audience was, um, was restaurants, institutions. When those dried up, he had to go uh, curbside and put up a, a farm stand and make some different cheeses. 
So that particular cheese maker was able to use those COVID dollars that way. We have a, a dairy farmer that has uh, gone value added because um, the price of milk was so uh, difficult. They decided to put on a, a bottling plant and they're using some of their COVID dollars to do that, which is allowed under the program. Uh, our farmers markets, uh, you know, they have uh, endured probably not as many vendors as they normally would do, and that's their income stream. They have had a, a number of added expenses with it uh, because uh, of the safety and, and protective equipment. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that, um, you know, they're taken care of and making sure that their losses are, you know, covered and extra expenses. So, as those applications come in uh, for the working lands and the, and the producers and, and you know some of our vegetable farmers had wholesale accounts that um, dried up early in the beginning so we want to make sure they're covered so I think the data that we get will probably um, allow us to make some really informed decisions but we are certainly open to um, you know adapting and changing and just making sure that uh, the money is used in the most effective way and gets it to the people who need it the most well it's going to be very important um to get that information from you as soon as as possible because um, I would expect three to four weeks we're going to be maxed out here in Montpelier or on Zoom and, uh, and we'll be going home. Uh, I know Jane, Jane has made it very clear that uh, that we are going to do the budget and we're going to keep working on it till we get it done as soon as the house gets it well we're already working on it and and uh tim timmy has said when the budget's done we're done which is good news for probably all of us um because uh we've already lost most of the off session uh meeting earlier um any other questions on the subject at hand? Uh, Ant uh, Anthony, you had a question? Yeah, just I was curious. I know that one of the things the Ag, Ag Agency was going to do is set up webinars for other kinds of outreach meetings. Yeah. I don't know whether they're, they're called meetings these days, Zooms, whatever they are, webinars around the non-dairy stuff particularly. I'm just wondering when those are scheduled and you know whether they've mm -hmm. happened already and what the deal is with those. That's right on. Yeah, it, yeah we have... We have um, We've got a number of those that either have happened or are going to happen. Um, if you go to, um, you know, our web page, there's a COVID um, page, and it outlines all the uh, important webinars. We've had a couple last week, um, and we have um, actually there's one uh, happening at 11 o'clock right now on my schedule here. So we are um, we are doing that. We think it's highly important to have uh, you know, people understand how to best to fill out the application, get it correctly, um, and, and, and assist them in any way that, that we can. But those will continue on. Uh, we're trying to get, also get the, the general media to have call-in shows uh, just so people can call in and, and so forth because customer service here is, is very important um, to us. And I know that uh, the staff is really working on to make sure that people have the best information possible uh, so they know that. But we are having webinars. We're having coaching sessions. We have a team that can answer those frequently asked questions uh, to make sure that they um, have the best information to apply. But very, very well, important to us. I also just want to back up because I think it was Senator Pearson may have mentioned that um, he'd seen a report. I know that under the 351, S 351, that the agency was supposed to send maybe monthly reports to the ag committees and others. And I haven't seen any of those. I'm just wondering, the, 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 did yeah. I just miss those? Did those happen? What's the deal with those? Yeah, we uh, we submitted one already. And I think we've got another one that's due in a, a little bit here. I think, uh, I'm not sure what the deadline is. But I know Diane's been working on it. And one good thing about these online programs, uh, we can get some rich data out of those. Um, uh, these these programs have been set up uh, online, so we can we can tell you exactly you know how many LFOs have applied. We can tell you you know what the payout has been, how many of them. So Diane, I know is working on that report, and I think we've got another one that's due uh, probably first of the month. Is my, yep. my understanding. Allison, is that correct? 
Yeah, let's do the first. Um, yeah. And we did send out the previous. There was not a lot in the previous report. Um, the, the agricultural and working lands application just went live um, last week. And uh, we also, Senator Polina held um, webinars for the technical service providers in addition to webinars for those that wanted to attend for application as well. Um, so there were three for applicants and one for technical service providers. What about, uh, we, put, we put some money into VHCB to help out with, with this. Is that all working out to everyone's satisfaction or? That's with the uh, farm viability, yes. So if anyone is, you know, has questions, maybe struggling with the application, um, they have people on standby that can help them. And that's, that's very important. We, we don't want people to be discouraged that it's, it's too difficult to fill out. It's, it, it may take a couple of hours, but there are people that can help them, can help them upload, upload documents if they need to, um, help them with the strategy of filling out the application. So farm viability um, with the Housing Conservation Board, I know you appropriated money for that group to help with that. Uh, and that process is underway. And we've been encouraging and messaging folks to reach out to them um, uh, to get that assistance if they need it. Yep. Uh, Ruth, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Um, uh, I just wanted to let you know, I did talk to one dairy farmer and this, uh, who decided not to apply because they or were going to not apply because they were concerned about it being a sort of quote unquote government handout. And I really talked to them about how this is not and they should apply and there's nothing to be ashamed of and, and that um, it's important that they take advantage of this money. So there is some of that out there, just this feeling of shame. Um, uh, and I reassured this farmer that's nothing that they did that was their fault. It was a global pandemic and they should get this money. Mm -hmm. So there may be some of that a little bit um, I, uh, going on. Um, so just making sure everybody knows that this it's important that they do apply and take advantage of the money. Um, I'm wondering in the, the sort of non-dairy portion, one of the things that... I know Senator Polina is concerned about and, and that we were all sort of wondering how it would play out is the whole um, thing about uh, profitability and that sort of window of time that we had put in there because we were struggling with how to define this program and whether you've run into applications that have been denied or people who can't apply because of that requirement and whether that's one of the things that we should tweak. Um, I, I don't have enough data to answer about whether it's whether they qualify or don't qualify. We've been very careful to make sure um, to go back to an applicant if we think that they um, may need to supply some more information to it. But the, the, the working lands and ag producer program is really uh, probably too early to tell um, whether people are struggling with that particular component of that program. I think maybe by maybe next week or the week after, we might have some solid data and some more evidence of folks if they are, um, are they struggling with it or if they're not meeting that, um, that aspect of it. But I think it's a little too early to give a solid answer on that. But we are, of course, as we mentioned, always open to making sure that um, you know, our programs are as flexible as possible. And, and hopefully yeah, um, get there. Anthony? Yeah, I just want to re-emphasize, re you know, on the one hand, I, I agree with what you're saying that it's too early to know the data is not telling us whether people are having problems with the applications or not. But on the other hand, time is really short because they, well, we, don't have, we don't have data for a couple of weeks. The deadline is in a couple of weeks. So it puts us in a real bind to do what we can to get this money out to farmers who really need it. And I think what I've heard from uh, vegetable producers and berry producers, maple sugar makers, other sheep and goat producers who are concerned about the both the deadlines and this no net profit stipulation that people are having trouble thinking they can verify that or that they're going to run into problems in the fall that maybe contradict the no net profit thing happening in the spring and the summer. So I just think it's something we really need to take a look at. Um, be sure that we're, we know what we're doing when it comes to making it making a fair process for the non-dairy farmers. I've also heard from a couple of people that 
some of the farmers markets are saying that they're going to have trouble applying because they, there's a minimum. They have to have $10,000 minimum income for the farmers markets, I think it is. And they're not sure that they can make that. So I think that there's a bunch of things that we need to just reevaluate and make sure that we're on the right, right path for. I understand yeah. you're in a difficult bind. I mean, I'm not, you know, you have a hard time because you don't have a lot of time to do this stuff, but we want to make sure that if we're going to do it, we do it right. No, I, I thank you, Senator, and thank you for the, all the outreach. And we are certainly, you know, we want to we want to make sure that you know people can get into this program and, and need. We know the need is out there, um, and we know you know we're up against some deadlines and time. But if you know if we can extend some deadlines, that may offer more more flexibility for folks. And and uh, um, um, what so we're, what I could do, Anthony, in the committee is uh, if that's if that's what the committee would like to do about the date and and maybe some uh, word changes not structurally but word changes to allow people more people in um i'll um i'll talk with jane today uh in a, in our committee meeting this afternoon and if if they're going to put a bill through you know a, a little corrections bill I'll explain the September 15th deadline and try to get that squared away. Uh, either tack it on to something that's moving through either, you know, finance or approach uh, and, and we could stretch that out. You know, it's a, if it's a minor change like that. Um, so I'll talk with them the, this afternoon and Chris, you're on finance, so you could, mentioned that that date may have to may have to be moved out uh, a little to make it all work and be fair to people yeah i think that would be good bobby i think um we have some like michael michael grady's worked on a little bit of language that could be useful in moving in that direction i i think a lot of the i think a lot of it could be done through the appropriations committee bill i'm not sure for, but but i think it could be done that way it's not they're not major changes they're tweaks that'll make the program easier for people to access and get their money's worth out of them. but see the the approach bill may not come until near the end which That's would true. be after the 15th but we may do a covet correction bill sooner that this would work this our issue would work in that earlier bill not the later bill yeah i hear you that's a good idea i appreciate that yeah Senator, sir Allison, yeah. I just i just want to uh, make a point of clarity to and ask that we work closely together on changes and remind folks that we've spent hours working with programming staff on the application and so when we start talking about um, you know, the, the uh, not being able to show a profit and, and tweaking those uh, particular uh, things that may be seen as small. Uh, they're, they're rather large when it comes down to the programming and the software companies that we've been working with. So just wanted to raise that issue. Well, it's still yeah. important that we do what we're meant to do yeah. in terms of getting the relief to the farmers. I mean, I, I have sympathy for the software providers, but I have more sympathy for the vegetable farmers, to tell you the truth. Yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we don't have sympathy, Senator. What I'm saying is the program's gone live and we have staff that's already um, working with the applications. And so the purposes of equity and changing it midstream, um, that, that comes into concern for those that have already applied as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll work with you, Allison, but you know, our crew has never forgot who they represent. And um, it's, it's, more the farmers than the workers. Um, I mean, we can adjust to about anything. Um, so, you know, we'll work with you, but uh, always keep in mind who, we, who we're representing. Uh, I Brian? Think, I, and I, I think we're all, we're all focused on, you know, helping yeah. farmers and producers. The only, the only caveat is if you make a change to an to a application, it may come with a cost, and we just got to be where the, who's going to pay for that. That's that's something that we want to we want to keep an eye on because um, you know we don't have programmers here at the agency to contract, so we don't have people to do that application. So I think that's what Allison's alluding to, and also you know um, the, and the people that have already applied as well. So we're we're all open to making this program better and so forth. And I think one thing we all agree on is maybe the deadlines could be extended. That would be an easy 
um, but he's, he's, yep. he's not going to change anything at, at all. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a little bit off the topic, but um, I did promise that I'd bring it up. Uh, and I don't know whether uh, Secretary Tebitz or Deputy Secretary Eastman can help with an answer, but I got an email today from a family-run wood-fired bakery in Middletown Springs. It's 18 years old. It's supported the family since 2003, et cetera, et cetera. 95% business model goes direct to consumer, meaning that before the changes brought on by the COVID, they would attend nine farmers markets and 20 or 30 festivals. So it's a sole proprietorship business, and therefore they have not been eligible for the majority of the grant support that's been offered by the CARES Act. And uh, they're under the gun like a lot of people. So they're wondering whether there's any additional funding available for sole proprietors and for any new businesses uh, from the economic recovery grants. And I told them that I would definitely ask. Yeah, uh, Senator, that's a, that's a good point. I think the administration has put forward a proposal that would cover that particular business uh, in the future because that is, as we've gone through this, um, you know, we've, we've discovered gaps and needs that maybe some folks weren't covered. Um, and that's the sole proprietorship one is, is one that's in line with that. And I think the administration, not, not the agency of agriculture, but uh, through commerce has put together a program that that group um, would qualify if, if there's some extra funding that's available that the, the governor has put forward. I think he's put together about $133 million program in that particular uh, segment um, needs some attention. So he's put some dollars in that would probably cover this um, wood-fired baking uh, business down in, in Rutland County. All right. Thank you very much. But uh, I don't, I mean, we started on a probe last week and um, I think that particular proposal's got, got a rough road ahead of it. Um, I mean, we saved we saved that couple hundred million dollars out of the first appropriations so that we would have extra money here at the end. And, and we haven't had, we as senators and legislators haven't had any input on that 132 that I know of. And I mean, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to discuss that I would presume uh, before, before it gets adopted, but that's um, you know that single proprietor and, and mom and pop say eh, that needs to be addressed. Yep. Thank you, Bobby. Um, any other uh, questions? If not, Anson, uh, uh, you move forward. Okay. Why don't we Why don't we dip into the budget because it does tie into COVID a little bit. And I don't know yep. if you want to bring the slides back up, Linda, or not. Um, I'm on the one that's the changes to the agency budget slide. There we go. Yeah, so there we go. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get our new budget completed. When we started this pre-COVID, we, the governor and agency put together a $750,000 one-time request and additional money for the working lands program. Uh, well, because of you know lack of revenue, we have withdrawn that. So that's one thing. This is the one-time money. The base money is still in there, which is about you know, $560,000, $570,000. The base money is still there. That is unchanged, but the one-time money. Uh, and that's was, general fund money too, right? That's correct. Yeah, so um, that helped the general fund. Right. And then um, uh, we have this USDA program that they picked out. They want electronic ear tags. Um, we had a one-time request of $25,000. We've withdrawn that. I don't think that's quite ready for prime time with USDA. So we've, we've taken that back. Uh, so that won't be there in, in, in one-time money to get that program going. Um, we've had some internal um, service fees, cost reductions uh, across you know, all of our um, Division, so that's there. And then this is another one that's it's important. Um, as we've established all of these uh, granting programs and um, 
pretty much we have a core group of people and even people that this isn't in their work description have been working on um, you know the cares act so we've got 1.5 million dollars uh, that we are going to offset um, some appropriations because they've been working on uh, you know response uh, they've been working on establishing these granting programs getting the programs up and running, offering technical assistance. Um, you know, our agriculture development division pretty much nonstop has been working around the clock on, on COVID related uh, expenses. So we're using $1.5 million in CARES Act funding uh, to help with uh, uh, our, our employees that are implementing um, all these programs. So that's gonna help, um, that's gonna help our budget because we're able to use a CARES funding uh, which means we're not um, having to go through um, deep cuts um, elsewhere within the agency of agriculture budget. And that that's for the 32 people that are working on. Um, yeah, COVID. yeah, and it's and, and and just you know, it is an estimate. We don't know, you know, but we we've done a deep dive with the business office, and we've got, um, you know, some people are working on this full time. Uh, we may have someone, for example, that's that's working in uh, you know, the Act 250, and uh, he may be working a, a day or two a week on uh, approving these grants and making sure that everything is in order so they can get payment. Uh, so we've got people that are outside uh, their normal workload that they're working on making sure that we get, it's about $40 million um, that you know, we're trying to get out the door uh, through these programs. So. We've had to repurpose people and they've some have been working exclusively on that. But we've got about 31 people one way or another, either a day a week or two days a week or five days a week. Um, they've been working on uh, CARES related issues. Um, and also some of the dollars will be dedicated to PPE as well. Uh, some of those dollars will be able to use uh, some of the CARES money. So um, that's our <laughs> that's in our budget, which helps our, our general fund. And and those that 1.5 CARES fund, that's not, of course, coming out of what we want to give uh, the farmers and non-ag. Right. Uh, non this is coming out of the general CARES fund uh, that uh, we're yeah. administering. This does not impact the grants that are given out. Yeah. This is just the this is just the you know the work that we're being done on it. So it doesn't impact the, the payouts of the grants. So it's not taking out of the granting program for yes. that. Bruce. So, thanks, Bobby. Mr. Secretary, is this money that you already have or that you're requesting from the remaining? We're, we're requesting this in our budget. Um, I and it's, okay. it's so we, we think we think looking at the, the sort of the flow chart of the workload that's going to go through this, we believe, you know, people will be working in this space for a long time and, and over time, you know, since July, um, we're, we believe it will be about a million. $1.5 million that will be um, dedicated to just working on CARES uh, issues okay. for the agency. Great, thanks. Yeah. And one other, and I don't know if it's on this slide or not, I wanna bring you to um, one other highlight. And this is where most of the other programs are all level funded. There's no um, significant reduction. One area, that we are reducing is there's a $619,000 reduction uh, from the clean water um, aspect of this. Uh, we are able to keep our core programs. So the on-farm um, programs, implementation of grants, you know, commitments to, um, you know, improving conservation practices to the farmer are all there. We are proposing cutting back uh, some of the granting programs to some of our partners, uh, whether it be the conservation districts or UBM, um, we're going to have to curtail that by about $619,000. And this is the result of, of what's happening with the Clean Water Fund. The Clean Water Fund gets a tremendous amount of money uh, through the uh, property transfer tax. And early on in this, um, that came to a, came to a halt it also gets funding uh, through uh, bottle deposits and so forth. And early on, you know, when recycling and all that closed, that had an impact. Um, so early on, 
uh, that fund has seen some reductions. Uh, so that is a result of uh, some of the early real estate activity. That fund is not as, um, as, as, as it was supposed to be. So we've had to curtail uh, some water quality grants of about 619,000. So I think that's probably the most significant part of our budget where we're facing you know, some dollars that we wanted to put more in, but we're unable to do. But on the farm stuff, we'll continue. Uh, the money to farmers will continue. It's just some of our partners that help with technical assistance and in, in, in getting farmers to a better place. We're not going to be able to fund them as much. Did you have you uh, had anyone analyze that? So when question when questions come up, um, you know we're going to have to answer answer them, and we we should have a some kind of a, maybe a list of what type of projects might mm -hmm. not get funded. Uh, the, I, that's for next summer or for this fall or for when? Well, it would be, um, well, I'm trying to look at the, trying to figure out what today's August. So it, it I guess that's a, that would be to de be determined. I'm trying to walk through sort of when we have these, some of these granting, some of these granting uh, agreements are now three-year projects. So we're giving UVM like three years. We're giving the watershed groups a pocket for three years so they can plan. So they're still going to be getting dollars from us. They're just not getting as many dollars from us as Quite they plan under this proposal. Yeah. Um, so um, when he... You said you were coming this afternoon to appropriation. I believe two o'clock will be in uh, will be in uh, Senate appropriations. Yeah. Um, so, uh, questions? Any other questions for Anson um, or Allison? I guess is still on. Um, no, uh, Ruth. <laughs> Is that so, uh, Anson? Is that is that it? That's basically the changes that you're requesting. Yeah, from I mean, your you know, we've been able budget. to we've been able to maintain you know our fairs and field days level funding. Basically, everything else is is pretty much level funded. The big highlight, I think, the two takeaways is you know we're not going to have as much money because of the clean water fund in, in the six hundred nineteen thousand, and also using the CARES dollars um, to help us. Um, with some of our budget issues, which means we're not going to have to go down that road of looking at um, general fund, um, you know, some of our granting programs like two plus two are yeah. impacted. They can stay, you know, they can stay where they are, which is in this in this climate is a good thing. Um, so that's I think that's probably the two main headlines as far as the budget goes. And no but, staffing reductions. No staffing reductions are in this um, in this particular. Yeah, it's, I mean, we, we as legislators, the people of the citizens of the state are very fortunate that we had such a good year in 19 because the tax revenues that we thought we were, of course, going to lose um, were a lot less than, than um, what was projected back there in, in, uh, earlier this year. Um, but it, when whoever does the 22 budget, I think they're gonna earn their money um, big time because you know, all of this year of 20, the money will come in you know, for, for the year of 22. And uh, it's, it's gonna be a, a rough time, I think. We've got to get our ducks in a row this year to prevent that next year from happening. Um, Chris? Yeah, uh, Secretary, going back to the Clean Water Fund, um, you know, that, that, that is obviously a choice that the Senate and the legislature and administration have some control over, but we're also in the middle of a settlement with the federal government that holds our feet to this. Are you confident that reducing funding and you know setting aside my issues with that choice, 
that we don't run into a problem with the EPA and, and their uh, expectations based on the settlement that we're in the middle of? I believe we're, we're gonna stay on course here because this particular uh, reduction is not focused on on-farm <coughs> implementation, but definitely on the ground. So those projects, um, you know, will continue to go forward. Um, this is more of our partners who are offering um, you know, technical assistance, which are, they are very important and we, we value that relationship because they're in the, you know, the non-regulatory aspect of that because they have strong relationships with our farmers of how to do best practices and, and offering, um, you know, financial assistance to those groups. So we believe that, but we believe we're on course. And of course, um, agriculture is, has already done a tremendous job on our farmers of uh, the progress. If you look at the phosphorus reductions that are out there on the statewide scale, our farmers have uh, stepped up and they continue to make incredible progress with that. Uh, they're being innovative um, and they're making those reductions. So we believe we can stay on course here. Uh, it's just that uh, some of these dollars and you know, it's no fault of anyone. Um, we have a pandemic and there's not as much money coming in. Um, so we have to make some difficult choices, but we believe we'll, we're gonna make our, um, do our best to march forward. And, and our farmers are still, they're still, despite this uh, economic climate are making an incredible investments in water quality. Um, and, uh, and we're pretty, uh, we're pretty encouraged by that, despite of all the financial issues that they're facing. And we're doing more, more work with our smaller farmers uh, because of the rollout of this program over the 20 years. And you know, our large farmers have been in this space for you know, 15, 20 years, and medium farmers for about a decade. And now it's the small farmers and certified small farmers that are, are, are doing their um, part as well. So if, if some of these like UBM uh, in the, conservation districts, if they're on a three-year uh, rolling average or rolling funding thing, uh, even if that, if that 619,000 is, is approved, uh, couldn't that come back in, in like a year or two if their economy turns around so that projects that are out three years could still be funded or is yeah, that I think I think yeah and the other thing to keep in mind here you know the um, in the clean water fund there is these estimates of you know the reduction of money that was coming in were based on the early stages of the pandemic I think some of the economists and we all know we've heard the anecdotal evidence of people moving to Vermont now and buying property and my understanding is the real estate market is quite active right now. That has not been reflected um, completely yet um, in those figures. So there may be some dollars that will, you know, in another six months or three years be dramatically different than they are as far as the, as far as the money coming into the state. Um, but the, the economist in the tax department um, will shed more light on that as, as we move along. Well, of course, in, I mean, in January, uh, you know, they'll start doing the budget for 22 anyway. So you, if the revenues picked up and or could be used, I mean, it could, could be funded, fully funded for 22 to offset this. Yeah. yeah the most important thing now is to try to get that, try to get the economy recovered and, and get people, get people working, get businesses you know, uh, open safely, and that will generate revenue, uh, so we can we can fund these programs, and that's why these CARES Act dollars are so important uh, moving forward. Um, and, you know, we've got another batch that's coming through, and a lot of that, you know, is really focused on economic development, uh, which is so vitally important uh, for us to keep moving forward. Yep. Um, other. Other concerns, Anson, or questions for Anson? No, we just we're we're delighted to work with you on you know if, if we need to change or pivot, we value the working relationship we have you and and uh, and I'm really proud of uh, all the work that uh, you know the, the staff has done here. They've really uh, worked incredibly hard to try to make these programs work and keep going, and I'm 
really proud of our, our farmers and our producers who uh, keep in mind have not stopped at all uh, through this program and through this pandemic. Um, and keep in mind, we're, they're always feeding us. And uh, I think agriculture is in a wonderful place right now where you can really make, make a difference and it's been rediscovered and sort of a renaissance, how important it is in buying local and supporting our landscape. So I think we're in a, I think you folks are in a wonderful position here over the next uh, several months uh, to play a really lasting impact on, on Vermont and the economy and we stand ready to help in any way we can. And how, how are our uh, small farms? Are we losing many uh, with uh, sales, uh, Anson? Just um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, at the uh, beginning of September, we'll have the, the latest uh, yeah. numbers. But you know, we're we're looking at you know 25 to 35 um, since the pandemic. Um, so it's you can tell the pandemic with uh, some of the early prices uh, that farmers were facing with 12, 13, 14 dollar milk, um, that did push some um, out of it. And, and it's across the board. I wouldn't say, I don't think we've lost a large farm during this. Um, they've, you know, I think the estimates and I think testimony was that, you know, the losses for them could be a million dollars for the year. And um, so it's across the board, but, um, you know, losing one farm is, is one too many. Right. Um, if, uh, Brian? Thank you, Bobby. I'm just wondering whether either Anson or Allison might have a suggestion if we were to move the date of the non-dairy application deadline, um, what might be your suggestion for that? Um, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the, I think it was December 15th was a critical date of, you know, money having to be out. Um, so we don't have to return any CARES dollars to the federal government. So we can right. begin there, you know, and um, you know, the more time we can give them and if we can still process and complete the applications and get the money out the door, um, you know, I, I'm not set on a date, but I mean, that 15th of December is a critical date. Um, so we've got to back that out. Um, you know, someone completes an application you're safe, you get another two weeks to get it approved or if there's any adjustments that have to be made. And then, you know, if you give another a week to 10 days to two weeks to issue payment. Um, so that's probably a month. So if you back it out a month from December 15th, that gets you to what? November Sorry. 15th? But okay. November 1st, I don't know. I, I'm, that's a date we might want to take a little more thought yeah. and I can, I can work with, but I think the most important one is making sure we don't return any federal dollars uh, to the federal government, or if we're going to repurpose some of these dollars that have been ag allocated to agriculture, that we have a, a close eye on where we want it to go. That's well, helpful. I, I wasn't uh, clear on, you know, what the administrative process was for receiving the application, getting it approved, making any modifications to it. And then finally writing a check and getting it out. So yeah, and I'm and I'm I'm padding probably a little bit of that. I, I'm just cautious about that. Just, you know, yeah. Who knows okay. what's Thank you. in the world? I think uh, Brian will certainly have some more discussion and on this whole issue. You know, as as we uh, do our work over the next uh, two or three two or three weeks. Um, so if there are there any other questions for Anson? If not, uh, thanks a lot, Anson, and stay yeah. in touch. And we'll, oh. we'll uh, as we come up with questions, we'll um, we'll sure to be sure to let you know what they are. Great, you all look great. We'll yeah. see you. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay. Um, Michael, do you have anything for us? Uh, just on the deadline issue, the reversion date is December 20th, not December 15th. The initial applications need to be in by October 1st for all of the programs. Um, so you should be aware that you're going to need to move probably four or five um, dates. 
uh, to make everything work the way you want it to work. Yeah. Um, well, and, and you've already started working on those dates, Michael? I did what Senator Polina asked me to do, but that he did not ask me to change the October 1st initial application date, um, but it's easy enough to do that. Uh, and then uh, it's about whatever date you want that initial application to be submitted. The, the issue with, with at least the dairy program is that they had an opportunity to put in a subsequent application after their initial application. So if you move the deadline back, you're going to have to consider when the subsequent deadline for for reapplication is going to be. You might just say that the initial application needs to be whatever date and that they can apply for for um, additional funds after that up until whatever date that reversion is. Is that mostly yeah. for the dairy people though, Michael? That's mostly for the dairy. And yeah. isn't there, the first date is this September 15th date, right? That, that the non-dairy stuff would transfer over. September 15th is the date when the um, secretary has the option to uh, reallocate to from non-dairy to dairy. Um, it says if non-dairy ag producer and processor assistance funds remain unappropriated on September 15th, the secretary may reallocate the funds to the dairy program. So it's, it's not an automatic, it's a discretionary um, authority. I just sent you the, the dairy update that I received from Diane on August 12th. I thought you were all receiving it. Um, when Diane sends them out, she sends them from herself to herself and somehow BCCs everyone else. So I don't see who's receiving it. I thought you were receiving it. Um, as Senator Pearson mentioned earlier, as of August 12th, there was really only about 11 to 12% of the total funds appropriated um, for the, under the dairy program. Yeah, and, um, and I think when I checked in with them, uh, I think 11, 11 out of the 33 big farms had, had uh, got their apps in and been approved. But that still left 20, I think like 22 uh, that, that hadn't got their stuff in yet. And yeah. those are the big guys and countless little guys hadn't gotten theirs in. Yeah, the, the, the report I have has nine of the large farms, but that, that's almost three weeks ago now. So I wouldn't be surprised if a few more have applied. Yeah. Um, and the, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, oh, go ahead, Brian. I think the next report is due a week from today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I think we'll get a much clearer picture uh, in the next one where we are. I'm going to guess it's going to be north of 50 or 60 percent instead of the 11, but that's just a guess. Well, I, I hope so from the testimony that we received early this spring. I mean, things were pretty glooming and I hope to heck, and that's why I, I wanted to push Anson a little bit. And I did call uh, BHCB to make sure they were doing their part about helping some of these people that were requesting uh, assistance. Um, can, I, can I ask the, Michael another question? Sorry, Chris. Yeah, if you... sure. Okay, My, uh, just to clarify, and maybe I should have asked Anson this, but the, the ag programs don't have that requirement that the ACCD programs originally had for the 75% loss, and now I think it's down to 50% loss, right? We just had any loss. 
and he, and he demonstrated um, loss of revenue or cost um, due to COVID. Okay, because I think that's another misconception out there is that they think that it needs to be a 75% loss. So I've talked to a number of farmers where I've said, no, it's any loss plus any expenses. Um, so I don't know. Well, and in most cases, just the loss in their milk checks from what they were getting in January or February and what it dropped to would cover, it would cover most every farm just in the loss of milk revenue with the exception of the organic guys. Um, but the conventional guys should have all basically quali qualified for the max in their in their small, medium, or large um, for that revenue. Uh, Chris, did you have your hand? Yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. That, that point that Senator Hardy just made is only true about dairy, right? The non-dairy do have to uh, have some percentage of loss, I thought. Michael, the the non-dairy cannot have a, a net profit, profit over a designated time period. Right. And you, you should have received a letter or you may have received a letter from uh, multiple organizations saying that it's A, difficult for them to determine that and B, even if they've had a net profit, they still might have had significant economic harm losses as compared to last year. And they th believe it's inequitable for dairy not to have that no net when they do. Well, and, and, and I think when we were setting it up, I certainly forgot of, let's say people would have a meat or a vegetable CSA and so they pay for that in February or March. Uh, so on paper, they are having a profit, but it doesn't really recognize the cash flow. Um, so um, I'm wondering if, uh, Mr. Chair, you mentioned VHCB and they're, we're hoping that they're helping people with technical assistance to apply for some of these programs. We want to make sure that's happening. But I also have heard that the, the applications are, to say the least, tricky. Um, and so I wonder if we could actually hear from some of the technical advisors to, to see if they have feedback that maybe would be wise for us to understand in terms of if there are changes we should ask for in the application process. I, I'm sensitive to Eastman's point that we don't want to redesign the whole thing. It's just a few weeks underway but but i also know that too often state government makes things about as hard as possible and uh, well, maybe, maybe we can at least hear to see the advisors who are helping people with the technical assistance if they had feedback maybe that'd be valuable yeah well, it also be it also be important to hear from some of the excuse me some of the farmers or the people that nof has been hearing from about removing the no net profit thing, that might make the application simpler. I mean, I, I'm not know for sure, but it seems like that's one way of re-envisioning re the application process that might make it simpler for farmers to show a loss as opposed to this argument around no net profit during certain months. So I wonder if we, I think we should hear from those folks who've been hearing from those farmers about that. <coughs> Sorry. I add that on my list um, about what you thought about doing uh, you know, a whole session, like, or as long as it takes uh, one session uh, to do uh, input from, from uh, farmers and concerned people, you know, applying uh, the whole nine yards on COVID funds uh, and how, how they're um, finding it working and, you know, just from the general public. Yeah. Uh, I, Oh, that's something you'd want to do, or I thought it might be a good idea. But. Yeah, I, I think that would be helpful because uh, I'm wondering why the applications are so complicated. And um, because I heard from a restaurant that applied for the sort of regular uh, application, a regular um, ACCD funds, and he's and the restaurant owner told me it took him 19 minutes to to fill out the form, and he he did it like that and got the money. 
So I, I don't know why the ag ones are much more complicated or if this is just an anecdote that doesn't bear out in the larger um, thing, I don't know. Well, I know, I, I would think ACCD would be too, but I know they're very concerned about the applications um, and whether they're legitimate COVID expenses, because if they pay out money and it's not, and the feds come and audit, then we got to claw that, you know, we got to pay, pick that up out of our own general fund money. And you all know we haven't got any extra general fund money. So that might be one reason why, you know, our crew's taking it to heart. And, but why don't we, uh, why don't we plan to have whoever's looking after this for Gus over at VHCB, have them at our next meeting to hear how that's going. And then maybe next week, give people an opportunity uh, to think about what they may want to say, but get it out there that next week at our maybe second meeting, we'll have it kind of an open forum and people can, can call in and, and get on. Would that work? Yeah, uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe we could get a copy of the application too. I mean, uh, yeah. it wouldn't hurt to look at it to see whether it is, in fact, as Senator Hardy mentioned, I mean, maybe it is really complicated. And then again, maybe it isn't, but two people thought it was. And so all of a sudden we're getting all these complaints when I, I, I don't think it would hurt to at least look at the application. Yeah, Michael, either maybe either you or Linda could get copies for us? Sure, I can get you a copy. Um, I, th I think the issue is, is demonstration of the economic harm, uh, of providing enough records or, or other proof um, to qualify and to ensure um, that it would qualify or be eligible under CRF funds. I think that, that that's the difficulty that some of the, the farmers are facing. Yeah, uh, Chris. Oh, but but the businesses over at ACCD have the same test, right? They have to qual, they have to demonstrate some, and and Mr. Chair, you mentioned maybe the agency, ag agency, is a little extra cautious, and they should be cautious. But in terms of liability for the general fund, the amount of money going out through ACCD completely dwarfs anything we're giving to ag, and so I got to believe the Scott administration is is going to be concerned about um, veracity of, of their awards through ACCD. So anyway, um, hopefully we can uncover what's going on, make it yeah. possible if, if there are improvements to be made. Yep. Um, and um, what day, what day would, other day would you like to meet? Uh, what day is easier for for you folks? Um, but we we'll do two days, two days or two mornings a week. And now this Thursday, I I almost think we have uh, in a props as a public hearing on the stuff on Thursday. What what two days would Tuesday and Friday? work better than because we already have to tie up Friday morning anyways. And Tuesday those could be a short morning, uh, you know, once the bills start coming in, but we could we could go directly from session to committee and it wouldn't screw you up on another morning. It, at least it would be you know, conti uh, continuous from our morning session unless we start running out of time. Tuesday and Friday works well for me. I have a problem with I've, uh, I have a problem with next Friday. If we're talking about Friday, the fourth of September. If we're talking, is that next week? Yeah. I have a problem with that morning. 
Other than that, I'm free. But that more Friday the third, Friday the fourth is a problem for me in the morning. Yeah, it's that's a week from Ash Friday. Yeah. Tuesdays and Fridays are both potentially short because we also have floor sessions. And, yeah, and we're, we're a committee that likes to talk. So <laughs> I'm wondering if maybe we should do at least one either Wednesday or Thursday that don't have conflicts with the floor. But um, I, well, we thought about <laughs> earlier Tuesday and Thursday. That that's work? Fine. That's fine. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, next Thursday I've got an appointment at, uh, <laughs> I just had a tooth extracted. So I've got an appointment at 1040 to see whether the dead guy's tissue is starting to regenerate in my mouth. <laughs> Thank That's you for what sharing. They do. That. That's what they do when they pull a tooth. They put a cadaver's tissue in yep. and then stitch you up. Okay, anyway. That is so gross, Brian. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. It's not a big deal. Maybe next, uh, maybe that would work. If we change that particular day, it would work better. I've got to uh, take my wife over to Burlington for a doctor's appointment to that day, the third, I believe it is. Yeah. So, yeah. so that might work better. We'll we'll decide. Um, let's see. Well, that's the day we were tentatively thinking about having a public uh, input. You know that. It'd be a week from our second meeting this week. How so, about we do the public thing on the second, Wednesday the second, and then not meet on the third? Right. Would that mm -hmm. work? Yep. Yeah. And and I I think Linda's on, so uh, I'm listening. I, he's getting this down. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll make a note of it so I won't forget. Um, no. Uh, so. Is there anything else that- um, What are we we'll, doing this week? We'll try to get somebody from VHCB on. Thursday. For, for Thursday. And um, and we'll also uh, might get a report on the um, applications from, maybe Michael could get those and send them to us ahead of time or Linda could, however, we can work that out and um, and uh, go from there. Is there, a, uh, Michael? So, so the application that's online is iterative. It, it basically um, populates as you enter in data. So, uh, and, and then you need to register in order to go further into the application process. So I've asked the agency to send over a full copy of the application because you, you just can't see it unless you register um, as a farmer online. So I, yeah, I I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard that people can't get it. On, you can only get it online. There's no paper application available to the farmers. So I, I'm going to ask for that full copy and I will send that over when I receive it. Yeah. Linda's asking uh, what time on Thursday, Bob? Uh, Thursday, we can, we can uh, roll at nine o'clock. Um, Bobby, I just, two things. First of all, Michael, if you are able to uncover the apparent report about school food service and what's going on, that would be great. I can't find it. Uh, I have asked the people in our uh, in operations that are supposed to receive them. If they've received them, they haven't. I've also reached out to Katie McClinn, who drafted some of that language for, what was it, Act 136. Um, I haven't heard back from her yet. My next option is to just reach out to Rosie directly. Okay, great. Thank you. And then the second thing, um, Bobby, is the that little... <laughs> the little amendment about field days um, and wondering what your thoughts are. This for the rest of you is this ongoing issue with field days in their welcome center, the Addison County field days in their welcome center and, and, all, and their uh, holding tank. Um, it's something I've been working on with them and Michael as well. Um, so there's just a little amendment about um, 
financial assurity on holding tanks. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, Bobby, how you wanted to handle that. If you and Chris have talked or what you want me to not, not this Chris spray um, and what you want me to. Now that if do. we all charged a dollar an hour for all the time that individually that everyone has spent on that, all these smokes, I mean, uh, but uh, Peter, yeah. I mean, it's unreal. It's uh, crazy. Yes, it is totally crazy. Uh, Peter has agreed to uh, the language change, I believe, to let nonprofits and charitable groups, is it, go without. He's agreed to that language, right? The commissioner? Yes. Well, they had they had wanted a broader sort of getting rid of the financial assurance on these yeah. tanks more broadly. But um, I asked Michael after talking with you and, and Senator Bray to, to draft it more narrowly. So I believe you drafted it, Michael, that it's about, about number of days that the tank is in use. Yeah, um, yeah that's correct. You might remember from, from now, it's about two sessions ago that you, the Fair wanted to use the holding tank, but they didn't qualify because their flow was too high. So you allowed holding tanks to be used when the event or the building is not going to be used for more than 28 days in a calendar year. So what the agency asked for is a financial surety, which the holding tank section requires any holding tank to have a letter of credit or other surety that uh, it will be maintained appropriately. The agency asked for that to be deleted entirely. And the language that Senator Hardy asked me for would only um, remove the financial surety requirement for buildings or structures used for no more than 28 days a year, which would be all of the ag fares. Well, I, I think that would- I to run, I'm sorry. You don't need me really, right? Um, nah. no, but you uh, I don't say that. <laughs> you may have to do some lifting with a former committee uh, that you used to be on. Happy to, Mike. <laughs> uh, no, I think I think uh, if the agency will support that, um, I think we ought to try to tuck that into somewhere along the way and get this thing put to bed. Yeah, I, I think Senator Bray was thinking potentially the Act 250 bill, and I know you and I had potentially talked about the budget. Um, yeah. So I guess my my thought would be that that's a chair's decision. <laughs> so I don't want to. Uh, but it, if you all can, if you want, just Bobby, I just want your direction as chair to let me know what I'm I should. Try well, to do I'd this. rather go it alone as a single bill then to hook it to that 250 bill. And, uh, uh, you know, we're gonna be doing, I would expect some other issues um, and we'll we'll find a home for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just, the commissioner asked me about it, so I'm just gonna let him know that um, we're still not sure. Um, he, they, they also, uh, he testified this morning in the house on, and this came up on in house natural resources, apparently. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Amy's probably, is she uh, supportive? Um, she's aware oh. of, of it because I, I let her know. Um, I, I don't know specifically, I don't know if she's seen the specific language, but I, I was going to send it to her. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Do you have your hand up, Michael? Um, so I think the commissioner's scheduled to testify this afternoon in House Natural. Maybe oh, he okay. maybe he got on the agenda earlier. Um, I, I just wanted to say that the financial surety amendment will turn down the bed covers, but it's not definitely going to put this issue to bed. Um, because they still have yeah. to finish the design and, and installation of the final tank. So yeah, they still will have to get another tank. Michael's absolutely right. Um, but this will make it cheaper for them. Right. So we're right. trying to find ways to make 
this new tank not as expensive. Um, we did have a very good, very productive meeting. I heard from both the agency and field days that the meeting was productive and they felt good about it. And we resolved a few things, um, but this is just a, helping them along the way and they'll still have to pay for a new tank because the, the tank they have is, is another big tank or another another five or seven thousand or what what yeah, size new tank, tank i think the tank they have is a i believe like five to eight thousand gallons too small they have to finish doing more flow calculations and it was hampered a, a little bit because there was actually no fare this year but i think they're going to work around that I think everybody's goal is to have this done so the fair can open next year with a tank, new um, tank. <laughs> boy, it's been I'm a so, long... I know, I'm sick of this too, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I really think that they should be able to do what they want to do down there as long as they don't pollute. And, and I mean, it's been a a mess. Uh, we do what we think will get them there, and then we find out that, well, this is missing, or that's missing, or they have to add uh, something else on. But anyways, that would be good uh, to get that done. Uh, anything else to put on um, this week's second meeting? It's, it's not necessarily that, but it's, just, it's a thought that I want to go back to when um, Ruth mentioned before the food programs. And they're talking with Michael and others about repurposing the dairy mon dairy money. You know, if there's not, if there, the law now says if there's money left over in the non dairy program, it would go to the dairy program. We're not even sure the dairy program would need that money anymore. But my thought was to repurpose that money towards nutrition programs, which could then be used to support Vermont agriculture as well. So instead of the money going from non dairy into the dairy program, go from non-dairy into the food bank or something where money would be spent to buy local produce. So it's just a thought for now to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so are we all set? Yep. Yeah. Well, um, we'll, um, we'll see you all tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow after lunch on, on the Senate floor. <laughs>